thank you. Good evening, wherever you are, whatever part of the world that you're joining us from. Tonight, I want to say good night to you, uh, to all our Guyanese brothers and sisters, and uh, I want to say also good night to Mr. Freddie Kisun. If you don't know me by now, my name is Leonard Gildari, and just about a year or so back, I was in the media. Um, I retired last year, and uh, now uh, it is going to be uh, a hell of a night, uh, Freddie, because you've asked us to uh, be in a place uh, to have some discussions on a number of items, and we are with the Gildari Freddie show. Gildari Freddie, I just got to start this thing by asking you, where did you find that tie from? I know um, you were late, so you need to apologize to yeah, the folks. Well, I, ap I apologize. This tie has to do with my lateness. I was able to pick up my wife's cousin and my wife's sister. My wife's cousin, um, Shireen Madhu, bought this tie for me about two hours ago. And that explains why I was late. The traffic is terrible. And then when I came down, I had to feed the most important thing in the world to me, my doggy. Well, uh, you know, so Freddie and his dog. That, that's a bit Freddie and his dog is something I think all Guyana knows about that. He says that whenever he goes to the airport, um, I wanted to carry my dog in the airport. But you want to do that? Yeah, yeah. All right. But these are serious um, topics that we're going to be talking about here, Freddie. Um, you could recall just about two years back, uh, we were uh, j just in another few weeks uh, on August the 3rd, it's going to mark two years since uh, President Fernandez was sworn in. And that would have followed a, a very um, uh, tough five months. We know all what went down there, but we are at crossroads here, Freddie, and ladies and gentlemen out there. Uh, Guyana is going through um, a, a tremendous period, a period where uh, a lot of decisions ha uh, are being taken, uh, a lot of things are happening. Uh, we have to discuss these issues, and uh, many of them that are sitting on the table before us has to do with the way that uh, uh, Guyana is going forward, our decisions that we're going to be taking, and decisions that have been taken. Freddie and I, uh, you know, we are no strangers to Guyana. We would have sat down on Kaicho Radio uh, just about two years ago uh, to try to make um, uh, uh, some kind of sense as to what was happening uh, with our country. Move forward two years later, there's a brand new government in place. Um, well, it's not brand new for Irfan Ali and Bajak, the led government. It is um, a place that we have to be very careful. And it's not our job to criticize uh, for the sake of criticizing. As citizens of this country, we have to be able to say it as it is, and you have that right too. And I know that many of you are joining us from uh, uh, North America, the Caribbean here, and already I'm seeing just over 1,000 live views here, which uh, is a, a strong indication that uh, our people remain uh, highly invested in what is happening in this country. Freddie, I want to start the ball off uh, rolling right away. Uh, I have seen you gone a little silent. Um, are you being paid by this government to stay quiet? Oh, but I'm, I'm not aware that I am silent. I, I've been accused, well, uh, let's see, Adam Harris said he wouldn't be surprised if the PPP is paying me. There were a few other people that, um, one or two people have asked that. I've been a guest on the television program with Naim Chan, and he told me, Freddy, you, you see, don't seem to be criticizing the government. Well, I cannot subscribe to the criteria or the yardstick that people use to judge me. I cannot subscribe. If, if people want me to be anti-government, well, I can't do anything but that. I am not pro-government or anti-government. I have an analytical mind. I have spent 26 years as a lecturer at UG. I am 34 years in the media and I have more than 55 years as a social activist. The combination of those qualities, if you want to use it, have shaped a philosophical outlook in me. And that philosophical outlook is not to A, to be fashionable in how I see my society, my country, B, play up to people who want me to be what they want me to be, and C, subscribe to the criteria that people use to judge, analyze, or comment on Guyanese society. I 
have to look out of my window. I have to look out of the supermarket, the car that I'm driving, and analyze Guyanese society the way I see it. Now, this thing has this thing about Freddie, you're quiet about the government. Freddie, um, you're not criticizing the government. Well, just tell me what is there to criticize. And if I feel that your argument that the criticism is justified, then I, I will understand what you're saying. But don't tell me I have gone quiet or I am subscribing to the PPP or I'm being paid for the PPP because you want me to criticize an elected president that I see is no different from Macron, no different from Motley, he's an elected man. He is doing things that I don't see. Any democratic government is, is, is not doing. Now, if you have a political agenda, you have an ethnic agenda, and that merges into a conspiracy of being anti-government, then that's your right. Except don't cross the line of treason and hurting people physically. But don't attribute, don't expect me to join that limited, unphilosophical bandwagon. No, that's not what I spent my life studying, my whole life as an academic. What happened, Leonard, and for um, Mikhail Rodriguez, whose platform we are on, if he's listening, what happened after 2020 has been one of the most fundamental transform transformative shift in my life. I have always had a multiracial company. I was born in an African ward in Georgetown. Um, four of my siblings married uh, uh, African people. I got early, very early political indoctrination, indoctrination for want of a better word, into multiracial politics. So I spent about a year as a 16-year-old youth with the PPP. I didn't like, I, I wanted to be freer. I went with um, the WPA. I consider that time in the 70s multiracial and then the AFC. And all my life has been spent fighting for democracy in a multiracial context without any cultural bias. Leonard, what happened in 2020 has been a cataclysmic tsunami transformation of my life. I have seen people, I have seen people try to bring back permanent power using ethnic criteria. Simply they perceive that the government that won the 2020 election is not of our cultural liking, is not of our ethnic liking, and therefore we are going to oppose it whenever uh, the election is declared, we, we, we will oppose it before the election is declared, we will oppose it after. Now, how can I subscribe to that agenda when one, I don't care who's African or Indian or who won the election. I voted Gildari on my family's life, on the life of all of those that I love close to my family. And I swear on my pets that I love immensely. I voted in 2015 for a predominantly Amerindian party led by an Amerindian man. That is how those who think I'm anti-government or those who talk their nonsense must tell us who they vote for. No, but they wouldn't tell us or they will, or, or, or they will lie. Now, after 2020, I have seen the direction that people have gone in and it's disturbing because it takes anti-Indian tones. Now, if you look at the people who either have stayed silent on the No Confidence caricature, silent on the 2020 Wigan election, and have been harassing an elected government that doesn't appear to me to be any different. This is not a government like Ortega in Nicaragua, Putin in Russia who has been jailed, which, which, which um, media house has been invaded, which person has in Russia, journalists suddenly fall out of a window, 
What is the difference between um, wholeness in Jamaica, how he's ruling the country, Motley and President Ali? But people say, you know, you're not criticizing the government. Are you being paid? I don't mind being paid. I, people have been telling me I've been paid by the government. If the government is listening, I don't mind being paid. Just tell me how much you're giving me and what am I supposed to say? And if you're paying me, you got to remember you can't control me. But a couple dozen millions coming my way by the PPP, I don't mind. 50, 60 million. I wouldn't want five or six million to be writing in favor of them to be using this radio program. No, they have to pay me that I could see a good, healthy old age. But anyway, let's get back to the serious thing about 2020. Leonard, and just bear up with me for, for viewers who are listening, please take note of what I'm about to say because it's very analytical and it paints a picture of Guyana since March 2020. But before you do that, Freddie, because this is interesting, uh, we have, Freddie has a lot of institutional knowledge over the years. You would have known that he's taken on the PNC, he's taken on the PPP, he's taken on all and sundry. I can remember at Kaito News, he took on Glenn Lal, and there were many um, times in our newsroom that uh, Freddie would have been up in the face of Glenn Lal and the rest of the staff for something that he uh, st stood up for, very principled from his uh, his, his stance. Um, for you who have now joined us, this is a Gildari Freddie show, and we are coming to you live on the Guidance Critic uh, Facebook page. We are also coming to you on YouTube. And if you don't know why the Guidance Critic, Guidance Critic, uh, you know, has a very large following. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We have our own opinions. We wanted a show. So how do you do that? And then build the kind of following. And the, it was a no-brainer. We spoke to Michael Rodriguez, uh, a.k.a. the Guidance Critic. And he said, of course, this is something that he had wanted to um and we are happy because for me i'm heavily invested in my country freddie i think as i get older and i think there's many people who are here we have almost 1500 people live watching us now people are becoming more interested more concerned uh with regards to the direction of this country it is not all about the likes like i said before it's not all about the likes that you're getting on facebook or wherever it is you have to start thinking seriously if you're talking oil money or dubai country a first world country you have to start thinking how can i get a better pension better roads you want a, a government which is accountable which is um uh, credible which is transparent and these are the kind of topics we want to talk about we want to talk about our, our investments that we make in with our oil money we want to talk about whether the opposition is playing a role are they really uh protecting the people, are they representing the people? 218,000 thereabouts voted for the opposition and they are a part of the uh, the Guyanese, um, how you say, the pie. Um, we want to make sure that everybody is accountable. What makes us um, uh, uh, qualified to do that? Well, the first thing I would want to say to you, Freddie, and the rest of the folks who are joining us, thank you for that, for joining us. Um, it is going to be an interesting uh, uh, program as we go forward and as we go forward to in our other programs I think we'll be looking at three days a week um, maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday around the same time right here uh, we're going to be coming to you to talk about this current issues, issues that are of deep concern to you and we know there have been many um, uh, we have seen the events on the East Coast recently we've seen the events of Rams Logistic we've seen people protesting about the oil deals We've, we're asking about uh, our performance of our politicians. We're paying uh, uh, politicians to go to Parliament, and we want them to represent us well. So these are the kind of information. And of course, we'd want you to send your questions uh, to make sure that you have your input into this, uh, this conversation as well, because it is going to be conversations on the uh, good for this country. It is not, uh, Gildari is not part of any political party. I'm not being paid. I want to, uh, I, I, I've asked Fred, Freddie because I want to lay the groundwork as to that as we move forward, that we're not here uh, the, because of any agenda, and I want to dispel any uh, kind of notions that would probably come from that. Uh, we're here because um, I can't sit on the sidelines, although I'm retired from mainstream journalism, uh, and does not say anything. Freddie, I've been saying it very quietly. Um, maybe on social media and I've raised my voice and I'm not too happy with certain things that is going on uh, uh, along the government levels I'm talking about 
maybe at the ministry level, at the state agency level. Maybe I have my own opinion with regards to, to how the government is being run. Definitely I have my own opinion with regards to the opposition and what they're doing also. And these are the conversations that we must have. Last night, I think yesterday, a plane landed somewhere in, in Madio. Over $400 million in cocaine. Um, is this country being used as a transshipment point? We know what are some of the answers to that, but should we be worried? These are some of the things that we have to talk about. Freddie, come back to you. You have, uh, we have been looking at the events of 2020 and how it, uh, we have emerged from 2020 to where we are. 2022, August the 2nd is going to be two years for Irfan Ali and his government. Um, let us talk about what you were talking there. Uh, and let the people have an understanding and put that in context. I listened to you the last time when Mikhail Rodriguez introduced the program, and I, I just listened to you. And um, you focused on, I would say, the unfolding developments which needs to be articulated. But um, given my given the given my evolution as a social activist. I see some dark sides emerging that are not within that orbit that you speak about. And that was tearing my psyche apart. And that thus the birth of this, um, uh, this program. Let me explain that. You know, there is one of the most famous, famous journalists all over the world. Well, there were two of them, and they became very famous for exposing a president, American president, and bringing about his downfall, Richard Nixon. That's Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Now, Carl Bernstein wrote something, and Leonard, when I read this, it's as if this man was talking about Guyana. I will tell you what Bernstein said, and I will read something to show you how graphically what Bernstein said could be applied to Guyana. Now, a preface to what Bernstein said. Traditionally, in political theory, this is hundreds of years ago, a society disintegrates, fall apart, and power becomes evil when centralized, centralized power becomes undemocratic, becomes totalitarian. So traditionally, political theory argues that society becomes totalitarian, autocratic, and loses its moral and its, 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 its moral fiber in its existence. When centralized power has no morality about it and is driven by, by hegemony, so it means that, therefore, in places like Russia, um, Cuba, Nicaragua, other authoritarian countries, you run into problem and the society gets into serious trouble when centralized power begins to go into dark directions. And that was the worry of the world with Trump. That is what some people are worrying around the world about Modi in India. Here is what Carl Bernstein said in um, his column in one of the most popular newspapers. Bernstein said that America is facing its greatest threat. When you hear someone say that hundreds of years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, you're thinking about hey, there's a dictatorship in that country and it's going to destroy um, the country. Let me repeat what Bernstein said. America is fa American democracy is facing its greatest threat. And then he went on to say where these threats are coming from. It's not coming from the government. The government has a very democratically elected president whose vice president is, is a, a Caribbean uh, Indian woman. Where are, these, where are these destructive forces emerging from that is threatening American democracy? And he, he began to enumerate them. Professors, journalists, 
the media, educated um, men who are racist, educated women who have a problem or, um, with um, women equality. And he began to describe how the focus is on the democratic government, the democratic party, because it's multiracial, it has a lot of blacks in it, it has a lot of Hispanics in it, and it's leftist. So what Bernstein is saying, he turned political theory on its head. And he's saying it's not the government that is going to destroy the society, but certain dimensions in society itself. Now let me read something for you, which is race baiting, expression of racism, and Leonard Gildarin for those people who are looking at us. What I'm going to read for you here isn't from social media, isn't from some madman on mainstream television, isn't people rambling on their Facebook. This is mainstream media that the embassies, the middle class, and a lot of people in Guyana read. You expect this race baiting. You expect this attack on the government to come from wild men in social media, to come from unorthodox commentators. Let me show you what is going on in this country and where it's coming from and pay attention to the famous journalist Carl Bernstein and what he said. This is what the Starbuck News wrote on Saturday about the guy who was killed and you had the, the riots, uh, you had the marches and then the attack on Mon Lepo. Listen to this. An editor of a mainstream newspaper, the Starbuck News, allowed this to be published. The officers who have been charged along with Dinobrika are of African descent. But the officers of Indian descent who were also on the scene of the shooting have not been charged. Is this a case where they were simply not culpable or is it a case where one group being protected in Guyana and another not? That is not true. There was no Indian policeman on the actual scene when that incident happened. Oh, and, 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 I know that. You were there? That, uh, there were, there, I, I got, just asking yeah, I got my sources. Right. I got my sources. There were two Indian policemen who were in the vehicle. Now, this could have been put it a, this could have been put a better way. Were there other policemen there of other ethnic um, origin, Amerindians, Indians? What were their role in the shooting? So you're asking these questions. This is an affirmative, assertive um, point that the Indians who were there were not charge is this a case where they're simply not culpable i have been 34 years in the media there is no way my editor the catholic standard father mouse would have carried this there is no way adam harris i had my problems with harris we had difficulties nigel mckenzie charmaine granger and you edited at one time nowhere such a statement will be carried. This is coming from mainstream media. How does this relate to Carl Bernstein? You know, there's a, there is a, a Portuguese um, mulatto organization being run by the Decaries family called Moray House. Moray House sponsors a monthly symposium, and Moray House has never devoted, never devoted a symposium to the um, no confidence vote, never devoted a topic to whether 34 members of a 6 to 5 member assembly constitute a majority and not 33. Moe House did nothing, no symposium, and they've been in business for six, seven years on the election. But there has been a systematic, systematic discu discussion on the National Heritage Fund, the oil contract. Um, you imagine this society was going back to the days of Burnhamism. I know what it's like. You're too young. I told Mikhail Rodriguez, you're too young. I know what permanent power is like, Gildari. I lived under that. And I was not going to see that happen in 2020 because sections of this society don't want an Indian government. No, you. Was you, it an Indian government, Freddie, or the wanted power to our cause? That's something I've been back. No, no, the P. No, no, you got you. You. 
you, you got some wires crossed there. And this is where the academic clarification has to come in. The PNC has always been interested in power. The PPP has always been interested in power. The PPP and the PNC have their battles. And they have the moments of exchange and moments of congratulating each other. It's a zero-sum battle between the two. I believe there are people in the PNC leadership and the PPP leadership that are not racist and they want power. Everybody wants power. Um, Lapar in France wants power. Everybody wants power. Um, the Republican Party wants power. What the PNC wanted after 2020 is power to run the country. The PNC wanted power, not for ideological or ethnic reason. That's the game, that to have power. But there were sections of that society, of this society, that weren't concerned with power. Sections of this society that reverted to an ideology of the 40s, where Indians should stick to the plantation, should stick to um, rural peasantry, should stick to agricultural production and let the descendant of the house slaves take power. You call such class the mulatto class. There is an extensive exposition of their existence, of their ideological orientation by Guyana's best sociologist who teaches at Berkeley in California, Percy Hinson. What happened in 2015, Leonard, is that this ancient and this traditional rejection that Indians should not be in power. They should be in business. They're not culturally, they're not culturally eligible and fit to run a West Indian government. We don't have no problem with them. Let them own mansions. Let them own 10 cars. Let them continue their business. And mulatto organizations from the 40s opposed Jagan opposed Burnham. In fact, the League of Colored People rejected Burnham membership. They didn't feel he was like complexion enough and he was landowning enough. When the PPP got into power in 1957, the mulatto class, the Portuguese class, that class joined with the United Force Party and the American government and brought down the Indian government in 64. Okay? From 64, you had a black government under a repressive president that did, would not have tolerated any kind of opposition, even coming from light-skinned black people and the mulatto class. So the mulatto class rejected Burnham, and they found, they found a forum to oppose Burnham, because Burnham had gone socialist, Burnham was too black. And they found the WPA a very, very quintessential elitist middle class organization whose intention was to remove Burnham and put the mulatto class in power. It's interesting to know that the WPA never had any substantial relation with the Indian PPP government, with the Indian PPP party. The WPA organized on their own. They organized in Linden. They organized in Georgetown. They didn't touch the PPP. Good. Matters, matters came pessimistic when in 1992, the West intervened and said we need free and fair election and told Jagan we need a pro-government, we need a pro-business party. That Indian party that they disdained from the 60s came back into power. And it ran Guyana for 20 something years. But that class of Portuguese, mulatto people and Christian Indians were never happy with it. And the WPA was reincarnated in 2005 when this very class of people, these classes, founded a new WPA called Alliance for Change. Middle class, Western values, lots of light, light complexion people. And in 2015, the final nail was driven in the coffin of Indian government in Guyana. That was it. The PPP was out, and from 2015, the mulatto class have taken over and will run Guyana permanently. Maybe through fair and fair election, maybe through rig election, but the PPP and the Indian supporters have gone. The dialectics didn't work that way. 
The dialectics didn't work that day. Just as how Burnham disappointed them, the mulatto class, the APNU-AFC disappointed them. The AFC, APNU could not, could not seriously put a proper economic paper on the table, could not properly reach out to people. And a very rejuvenated PPP decided we are, are going to enscone ourselves in the, in the people of Guyana from 2015 because this government is not performing AP and UAFC. And much to the chagrin of the mulatto slash Portuguese class, the APNU AFC lost a valid legal election. But so Ali, this, this Muslim man who's an Indian and all his agricultural ministers and all his ministers who are Indians, they are back in power. And from 2020 August, they are class forces in Guyana. They consist of Christian Indians, yes, Indians, but who are Christians. They consist of the mulatto people. They consist of certain segments of the Portuguese uh, class, like the um, Starbuck Jews. Mm -hmm. And that is where, um, Leonard, that is where the focus against the government is coming from. Don't worry with the PNC. Who listens to Sherwood Duncan? David Hines have gone so extreme, the people probably in the business and the Exxon people and the embassy people probably don't listen to him. But you know who what they read? They read the Starbuck News. And there has been more poisonous output. Leonard, that is my work, to read every newspaper, to see what people are saying. There has been more critical, more critical, trenchant condemnation of this government coming from the Starbuck News, certain women groups, than the PNC self. Now, that may sound alarming and some people may be typing into you saying what Freddie is talking about. Let me tell you out there what I'm talking about. There has been more acidic, pungent criticism of the performance of the PPP government from the Starbuck News than from the PNC itself. Now, what is dangerous about that is that that has more influence on people's thoughts. The Starbuck News, these women groups, Red Tread in the Diaspora, edited by uh, Dr. Alicia Charts. Those things have, those fall off have more influence than a Sheva Duncan every night in the program. I ring in the bell. I ring in the bell. You see what they're doing? The thief in five billion. Nobody listens to that. They listen to what the star book says. Because the star books, as Mikhail Rodriguez sat next to me, said when this program was introduced, they appear more credible. So to put in a nutshell, I've been speaking a long time, it's your turn. To put it in a nutshell, I see some dark forces emerging that is more conspiratorial than the mainstream opposition in this country. And I wanted to bring that out. And I felt a program like this could be our avenue. It's a social knowledge, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not joining us, this is a Gildari Freddy show. And you know, Freddy has a lot of history and he knows a lot. But coin affairs is something that we are also very interested in. How is this government performing? Uh, Freddie, you touched on the issue there of Starbuck News, and you also spoke about Starbuck News being uh, uh, the way that it is. it's going to form those opinions that might be very dangerous to this country. I want to ask you about the role of social media. Recently, we saw uh, the YouTube uh, videos, uh, we saw Vice News, and so on. Should Air Fanati be worried about what is happening? Should uh, Barjak to be worried about that vice use? Because whether we like it or not, it is something uh, that... Uh, what is your analysis? A group, uh, a media group came into the country led by, by a journalist that is well known. Um, I'm not going to talk about her credibility. What I want to know, she was here several weeks being taken around the place. Things were said and uh, we know what, was pl what played out here. Did the PPP take a hit because of this? So well, I don't, be I don't want, I don't, I am not joining the chorus of vice, 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 because that, that could be a, that could be a distraction. That could be a distraction for, look, 
I'm a political analyst. If, I, if there's something said by vice on what the government is doing, that in itself is for discussion. But I don't want to make it an obsession, and I will not make it an obsession, because people have an agenda. People have an agenda against this government that even if there wasn't vice, there would be mice and there would be size. Who would be so, behind that? Who would be those persons? In the, your those forces that I do, I, I do not. I, I believe those forces are coming from civil society. You know, Leonard, people, there is a body of knowledge out there that is just waiting to be put on people's lap. Let me give you an example of where, that is why I, 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 I'm not concerned with Sue and Lou and Moo. I'm concerned with forces that want to create instability in this country simply because they're anti-government. I was anti-government, but I felt I was anti-government because of things that were happening. I mean, look, things that have happened to me. I almost lost my life twice. So vice and mice and size and Sue and Moo and Lou, let's look at where certain forces are coming from. Leonard, the Starbuck News for 10 weeks have interviewed 10 so, um, civil society organizations, 10. They have, those civil society bodies have not even alluded to the no confidence vote. That is a vote in which under the constitution, you call an election after three months. Those people stayed in power one year and then went to one of the top courts in the world, the Caribbean Court of Justice, and said, we are not um, calling election because 34 is a majority of a, a 65 seat parliament. 10, I repeat, 10 weeks, the Starbuck News have interviewed a different civil society body. And not one of those civil society interviewee touched on the no confidence vote, touched on the most disgraceful attempt to rig an election in the 21st century. And you know what? Do you know what happened with those 10 um, interviews? One of the most important civil society group that during my time as an activist, I saw save this country in 1992 on the super sad. When in 1997, the PNC rejected the thing and wanted to um, uh, say that the election was rigged. And eventually, CAVICOM came in due to the private sector commission involvement. And we've had the Hermanson Accord. Now, let me, let me go back to this. Ten civil society bodies are interviewed. And you would think the one that will get an entire interview is one of the most powerful ones that played great roles in this society, the private sector. They give the private sector half an interview. They just carried about three, four paragraphs what Jerry Gavaya said. Can't you see where we're heading? None of those civil society talked about election. None of them talked about um, uh, the no confidence vote. And the Starbuck News have given 10 weeks of coverage to different civil society groups and the private sector got just a few paragraphs. Leonard Kiltari, I'm an analyst. I see meaning and importance in that. And that is why we have this program. I am telling people out there, ask yourself why the Starbuck News would interview Red Tread, the Guyana Human Rights Association, um, this women group, the homosexual group, Sassad, give them full coverage, but not the private sector commission. Well, are, you, are you giving too much credibility to Starbuck News? What about the social media? We've seen right, the let's guy talk about no, social media. I want to right. talk about that because whether we like it or not, uh, social media has changed. It has shaped, it is shaping uh, during the last election, 2020 election. It's not only... That is not only something that is um, uh, for Guyana, it's all over the world. Social media has been shaping, and we have known there's been accusations of Russians playing a role in the American um, elections, and we could talk about China and so on.
but social media we can look at the guidance critic right here um we could look at uh, the various social media website are the newspaper uh, are you giving too much credibility to the newspaper that's one i want to ask and I, then i also want you to plunge headlong into this supposing you were to sit down i have a face-to-face -face with air finale and air finale says to you president air finale sorry and he says to you um freddie uh, you could tell me three things that you would like to see in this country and I'm going to work uh, to make it happen. I'm the president of Guyana. Um I want you to answer about the role of uh, social media and the impact it has and whether you're given too much credibility to Starbuck News and Kaichur News and the Guyana Times and, and so on as against voices so, uh, social media like the Guyanese Critic and we could name a few others that you have out the big Smith and so on. I concede, I concede that social media would have more influence on people. Um, I think the way the society has gone, society meaning the society, not Guyanese society, yes, social media can reach people that, so I would say that social media would have as much a greater influence than the Starbuck News, though the Starbuck News has to be emphasized on what it's doing. Social media, I apply the cut last theory. I apply the cutlass theory to understand social media. I have three cutlasses in my arm to rule. I have never killed anyone with it. There have been countless deaths through the use of a cutlass. What's the uh, uh, analogy with social media? You can get someone at social media screaming, Oh God, look the beating uh, Indian people. Look the beating black people up there. It's, it's not true. And... Uh, it caused it cause a thing. But then you could have social media where people, like critic, like yourself, take serious factors in society and interpret them for the ordinary people to understand. I mean, one of the reasons of, we could use to show the importance of social media is the man whose platform we're using himself. Mikhail Rodriguez, a.k.a. Guyanese critic. The, pri the Guyana Press Association jumped and said, listen, um, social media got its flaws, social media, no, 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 you can't give interviews. They were directing their attention to the government. You can't give interviews. Um, they were talking about President Jack Dio and others who go on Rodriguez's program. But... Social media becomes salutary. Social media becomes important. When an executive member of the Ghana Press Association, Dennis Chabal, appeared on social media, when this lady who's interviewing the civil society, a, civil, a different civil society organization each year, I, um, I can't remember her name um, from the Starbuck News, she, um, she was on social media. What's the point? The point is the Guyana Press Association is probably afraid of the reach of Mikhail Rodriguez, but they're not afraid of the reach of David Hines. Who spoke, they're, not they're not afraid that David Hines is negative, that social media is negative. When they go on David Hines' social media bandwagon and they say what they want to say, but government should not go on Mikhail Rodriguez's bandwagon. What's the point? The point is, there no social media has a role to play. And therefore, they want to downgrade social media. Who is there? The people within the media well, or somebody? Media? Well, I, I think it's, well, it's clear the Guyana Press Association is against social media, the way they carried on with Mikhail Rodriguez. It, it's clear. It's, I, I think it's the Guyana Press Association. It's people who also feel threatened by social media. Let me tell you, how, much people, how many people know that the Guyana Press Association, Dennis Chabal, went on social media, although the Guyana Press Association denounced social media and denounced Mikhail Rodriguez? Now, what is happening is that they know, you know, what's the, you know what was the, the beef about Mikhail Rodriguez and ministers giving Mikhail Rodriguez? The beef is he's going to take away He's going to take away their credit. And their credit is mediocrity. I could just give you one example. If they were doing their job, 
you would not have a Mikhail Rodriguez. The reason why I ask you to be on this program is because I've known you more than 15 years. I edited the news section of the Kaito News and we sat next to each other. And I saw how you chase stories. And I said to myself, you should not be out of the media. I know you've gone into business, but you have done well at Kaicho in terms of news breaking story. I sat right next to you the way we're sitting now. And I know the stories you have followed. I know you were the only journalist that picked up on what Rafael Chartman said, that the, the, the AFC didn't give him a, a ministerial job after 2015. It was the president who called him and offered him the Ministry of Natural Resources. It was the president who gave his Queen's College friend, um, Noel Holder, the job of Minister of Agriculture. And you picked it up. If you were in the media, I am absolutely sure you would have gone after Ram Jatan and David Patterson. What is the secret arrangement in the Cummins Burger Accord, Accord that the Guyanese people cannot know? So when you, when you and I start to chat, I said, Leonard, you cannot fade from the media. You have a role to play in the media. And I was so glad now thousands of people are looking at you. So why are they against social media? Because they do not do their job. Listen, read the last interview in Sunday Star Book with the chairperson of the Ghana Press Association, Nazima Ragobiel. She devoted not one word to the nonsense, the miasma, and the mediocrity in mainstream journalism. Not one, not one word she devoted to that. Look at Dennis Chabal, who's a member of the um, Ghana Press Association. This man runs a mainstream news outfit called the Murawa Waves. For the past six months, this man features as his lead story an organization with four people in it. Clive Thomas, David Hines, who live overseas, Desmond Chotman from GCOM, and Takuma Ogunse. Four people in an organization called the Working People's Alliance. And it's front page. You know, this news outlet that called the Mara Waves also has a column, a columnist, just like how Starbucks News Kaicho News, uh, that columnist is one person only and is thoroughly anti-government. How they have to be afraid of social media? Because if you don't have social media, that kind of mediocrity that goes on in, um, in the Marawa Waves you know, would not pass. I would like to ask Nazima Ragubeo when they criticize social media, if she thinks Dennis Shabal if she think um, God Mosley are better than what takes place in social media. Thank you very much. You know, joining us, this is the Gildari Freddy Show right here being hosted uh, or facilitated by the Guyanese Critic and also the Daybreak News and also on YouTube. And we, w I want to ask you, I did ask you and I didn't hear you answer, Freddy. Supposing that you were to meet with uh, President Ali, and what are the of three course, things opposition that... leader? I, I want to throw in another one to you, yeah. opposition leader, and you have to say three things I would like to see out from you to better this country. What would you say? Um, three things to Irfan Ali and three things to... Yes. Right. Well, I have, um, I have spoken to uh, um, the president and I have given him things that I'd like to see to be done. The first one is I think he should use state resources and he should use the skills he have to reach out to constituencies that are not supportive of his party. In other words, he should embark on a campaign to win hearts and minds, not necessarily your supporters. I think he has the way with all. He has the decency in him to pursue policies that are not um, vulgar. That are, that are inclusive. Now, he may not do it in ways people like, but I, I would think that is the first thing. The second thing I would like him to do is to elevate um, our poor people, the, uh, the ordinary people need. Um, uh, after so long, 70, 70 years, poor people need to be treated better than they've been treated the past 70 years. I'll give you uh, one example. I, I saw... Professor Clive Thomas on social media 
He's on social media quite often with David Hines. And he admitted, and that's a program people should see, he said, well, at last we have some money. We have some money that could be used to alleviate poverty. That's Clive Thomas saying that. So he's admitting, he's a WPA guy, he's against the government. He's admitting that we have some money. I would like to see that money used to the betterment of poor people. And I am talking about going back to Burnham days of the multilateral school. I think you should have a school competing with Queen's College in the regions. And that, that, that school must be fitted out with the best labs, the best teachers, and must be a school of excellence because those people are at a disadvantage. Queen's College is a Georgetown Region 4 school. That's what this country is 800,000 people. Region 4 only has 200,000 or maybe 300,000. Quickly, if you could move on to the opposition leader. Oh, oh, I would say to the opposition leader, do you accept that election is the basis for forming government? And if he says yes, then I would say to him, then you cannot invent, you cannot invent disturbing stories, evil stories, that you've lost the election when you didn't win. So either form an alternative to election and take that theory, that paradigm, and put it to the country and say, listen, we're not into elections. Elections don't work. But if you're into elections, you have to do the fundamentally basic decent thing. Rally people to vote for you and win. If you cannot win, say, admit you have lost. Thank you very much, Zira. And I, I mean, advice that it's almost program time. I wish it could go a little longer. But we're going to be back here at 8.30 on Wednesday, same place, same time. And I must tell you, there's so many things. I, I, Freddie, I, 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 I think... We haven't even scratched yeah. the surface. Yeah, yeah, we haven't even uh, done that. And so many things. We want to talk about corruption. We want to talk about that those oil money. We want to talk about, uh, of course, uh, we've seen protests. No, but we can't, we can't forget five years. If we're going to talk about corruption, Let's we talk can't talk about corruption with Sue and Mu. We right. have to talk about the minister who got a million dollar gold band. Well, you know? we have to be talking well, about um, everything, um, Freddie. Um, uh, the Minister of Home Affairs, Robson Ben, said when he went into power in 2020, August, he found that almost 60% of permit for license didn't go through the normal channels. I'm not going to sit down here and talk about Sue and Moo and Vice and Mice and overlook just the other day. No, we have to go right. back. You have to go back. To James Bond. To be better, right? Now, if I work for another 100 years in the public service, I wouldn't get that money James Bond got from the port selling land to a foreign company. Well, he has been charged for it. He, he got a hundred, he got a million US. That's two, 210 million. But James Bond got that money and they say PPP is paying me. I want that, that kind of money. I want the PPP to pay me a million US and I'm going to devote this program to them and my column to them. So oh, ladies that? and oh, gentlemen, uh, there you have it. Uh, we have many other topics that we want to touch on. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Wherever you would have been joining us from tonight, I want to say good night to you. Uh, we are going to be back here on Wednesday and of course, so many things to talk about. Uh, we haven't, uh, like Freddie said, scratched the surface. But Freddie has always uh, been good for giving us um, uh, analysis. And I'm hoping that uh, you would have found it, you know, informative. We're going to have serious discussions here. We want to talk about things, you know, in a respectful manner. And I hope that it has been uplifting for you. Um, it's not easy for me to be back behind the cameras but it, and behind the microphone. But it has been, of course, a, a, a pleasure. And I'm sure that Freddie, thank you very much for the show. But we are going to be doing more. And I want to say thank you very much to uh, Michael Rodriguez, a.k.a. Guyanese Critic, for allowing us this platform. It has a huge reach, and uh, we would have had almost 1,700 people, persons um, uh, tuning in to us uh, right across Guyana, across the Caribbean, and, of course, North America and elsewhere. And, of course, good night to our Guyanese brothers and sisters, wherever you are. Uh, we, we hope that you stay safe, be safe on the roadways. Until then.